Hi, I'm Kenton, and this is Kenton Knows. I have been the owner and managing broker of Kenton Realty Group since 2002, and I have significant experience buying and selling residential real estate, both for myself and my clients. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through the steps in a traditional home or small residential investment property purchase. This video is really geared toward the beginner, but in my opinion, we're always learning even when we have years of experience. Please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, click the bell, and of course, I would love to hear from you by leaving me a comment or question. Now, let's get started on how to buy real estate. I'll start by letting you know I have videos on how to choose a real estate agent and how to buy your first investment property. So this video will be focused on the actual transaction along with some strategy and advice for each step along the way. Where do we start? First, you need to know what you can afford before doing anything. I'm not going deep into this, but you need to know your income and expenses. If you aren't sure, start by going to Zillow.com or Realtor.com. Use one of the affordability calculators. If you want to be safe, come up with your number and then practice by automatically putting that amount of money into a separate account, minus, of course, your current rental expenses, for the next three months or more. No exceptions. See how comfortable you are with that, and if you can live that way for the foreseeable future. Adjust as needed. Next, talk to a bank or mortgage broker to get a pre-approval letter. This is important, and you should not have to pay anything for it. I have included a few mortgage brokers I've worked with and highly recommend in the description below. It doesn't matter who gives you the pre-approval letter as this isn't obligating you to use that lender and you don't need more than one. If you served in the military, be sure to research a VA loan. And if you qualify for a FHA or other loan program, you should look into them to see if they are right for you. It's okay if you're approved for more than you're willing to spend. That's a good thing. As I'm sure you'll learn if you haven't already, you don't need to have 20% for a down payment. There are many options available, so be sure to talk to several lenders about the various programs that you may qualify for and give you the best loan for your needs. The odds are you will probably discover that you can get a loan for more than you may be comfortable spending. So be sure to stay within your comfort zone, even though the lender may say you are qualified for more. Don't overextend yourself Owning real estate comes with unexpected expenses, so you don't want to be stretched too thin. After you have your pre-approval in hand and know what you can afford, what's next? I'd recommend researching and discussing what you are looking to buy. How many bedrooms, baths, parking, where is it located? What are the must-haves? What are the nice-to-haves? What are the things you absolutely don't want? These things may change, but you need to start somewhere. Next you'll probably want to start looking online, but I'd also recommend starting to search for an agent. My video on selecting an agent is extremely comprehensive, and I'd recommend watching that video before you start talking to agents. After selecting your agent and going on your first tour, I'm sure you'll refine your criteria, which is normal. One question I get asked a lot in the beginning is, how will I know when I find the right house and if it is a good deal or not? It's a little hard to answer that when you start because I know everything is a little overwhelming, but my honest answer is you will. Everyone I've ever worked with knows when it is the right house and after looking at a bunch of properties in the same area, you will be surprisingly knowledgeable and aware of what's reasonable and what isn't by the time you make an offer. So trust yourself, look at a lot of properties ask a lot of questions, even if you think they might sound stupid, this isn't the time to pretend you know what you are doing. If you are buying a house, remember it will be your home. In my opinion, buy a home you'll enjoy living in. Don't buy a home that is a good deal if you'll hate living there. If you are buying an investment property, that's a different story. Buy an investment property because it is undervalued and it will cash flow, or the area will appreciate, or hopefully both. These are not the same thing. I know you may want to conflate them, but in my opinion, you will regret living in a home you don't like while you hope and wait for appreciation that may or may not come. 
When you find the property you want to make an offer on, don't be afraid to go in low. I don't agree with the attitude of not wanting to offend anyone or any of the similar arguments. The seller wants to sell and both agents have an obligation as licensed agents to present all offers. You don't know until you try and I believe you can still recover from a low offer if you're willing to pay more. Or you can walk away and move on to another property. Start by asking your agent to give you a list of recent completed sales of comparable properties in the area. These are normally called comps. I would look at the lower price closed sales that are comparable, not teardowns or foreclosures, and aim for an initial offer in that range. Put together your offer and have the agent make the offer without any real explanation other than it is based on the recent sales and it is what we think the house or property is worth. See what happens. If the seller starts negotiating, no need to go crazy with the rest, but if the seller balks, we have some other options. The worst case scenario is the seller doesn't want to counter because they're offended or similar. This, in my experience, is rare, but it does happen. And when it does, your agent simply needs to say something like, my clients are new to this, can you just have the seller counter with something and I'm sure I can get my clients to come up. This normally gets the negotiation started and you'll probably need to come up if you want the property. Of course, if you think the seller is way overpriced, maybe you'll need to say, we are interested in the house, but think it is overpriced, please come back to us if you'd like to negotiate. I have done this and checked in a week or two later and been able to restart the negotiation when the seller realizes they aren't getting any other offers. Now, there is a little strategy mixed in the negotiations after the initial offer and counter. You may have noticed some issues that you know will come up in an inspection, like an older roof, tuck pointing, painting, galvanized plumbing, older appliances, or similar. I would keep those in your back pocket at this point. During the initial negotiation, only use items that an inspector probably won't catch or bring up. At this point, it helps to have the agent explain to the seller all of the reasons you may not like the house, even if those items are not a real big issue for you. If it is close to a school or transportation, that may sound like a positive, but you can say you don't want to deal with the congestion. You can literally make up anything that helps you justify your price. The more rational, the better. But honestly, your opinion doesn't have to make sense to the seller, only the price you are willing to pay. You can say you need to completely renovate the bathroom or kitchen. Maybe the layout doesn't work for you and you'll need to reconfigure it. You aren't committing to doing anything. You are merely trying to make them understand why you don't believe their asking price is worth it for your personal expectations. It is a fine line where you're clearly interested in buying the property, but pointing out the negatives to get it for a lower price. Obviously, this all goes out the window if there's multiple bids on the house, but I'm assuming you aren't dealing with that situation. Another tactic I've used to unnecessarily complicate and distract in the negotiation is to throw in extras. For instance, I had a client buying the top floor in a high-end condo building with a private roof deck. The seller had a very nice speaker system wired throughout the house and roof deck, along with a high-end commercial grill on the roof. We are talking about a $700,000 condo and we knew the seller was moving to a million dollar plus house in the suburbs. So we included the grill and the speaker system in the offer. The seller claimed that the value of those items were $10,000, which my client and I agreed was a very high estimation, even if they were brand new. We basically ignored the response and continued our negotiation. After we reached a price we were happy with, I said that we thought about it and we don't want the grill or the speakers, so we'll agree to the deal for another $10,000 less than our current agreement. The seller wasn't too happy, but they did agree as that was the number they gave us to start with. And in the end, the seller didn't even bother taking the grill or the speakers anyway, as we both knew they weren't gonna work at the new house. So that's another tactic you may want to try in the right situation. Getting back to the negotiation, you can try to appeal to the seller's emotions. Are you a young family just starting out and you'll love and enjoy their home just as much as they did? Or are you struggling in some way and this property is the answer? 
Whatever you're doing, make it a little more dramatic to appeal to the seller. If the seller, on the other hand, is being dramatic about their situation to sell, don't try and be more dramatic. It's not going to work. In that case, you need to simply show comparable sales, explain the work required to fix the property, and say, this is the most you're willing to pay. Be prepared to walk or at least step back for a couple days if you feel the need to change the dynamic in the negotiation. Each situation is different, but hopefully some combination of these tactics will get you the price that makes you happy. Also, in regards to earnest money, you definitely should not put down more than you have to. I prefer to start low, like $2,000, and let the seller ask for more. This serves two purposes. One, it shows you're giving something up by increasing this amount. And two, it's a little bit of a distraction or complication to hopefully help you in the negotiation. Even if you give up inconsequential items like this, it still gives the seller the feeling of a win, and you really didn't give up anything material. One other item I like to stack in my client's favor is the mortgage contingency. The whole point of this clause is to allow the buyer to get out of the deal without losing their earnest money if they are unable to get a mortgage at the terms in the contract. So I like to include a low down payment, like 5%, and an interest rate that can really only be achieved with something like a 20% down payment, no points or costs. Other agents have rarely called me on it, and it really protects my clients in case they need to get out of the contract. Of course, if the agent does catch it, we'll make adjustments. And again, here we are giving concessions that really mean nothing. But if you want to buy the property, the concessions on the mortgage contingency and earnest money have literally no effect on your purchase price or closing costs. But they hopefully make the seller feel like they're getting small wins at our expense, which will hopefully help us where it matters most, the price, or closing date, or anything else that matters more to you. Keep in mind, the negotiation is a dance, and it can be annoying, but it is required. In the end, both the seller and buyer need to feel like they got the other person to give up more than they wanted to. There is a lot of ego involved in the negotiations, and if either person feels they are really being harmed or shorted, they won't agree. So we need to build in wins for the other side to let them feel proud of their negotiating ability. Once you have a signed contract, you'll need to get the contract to your attorney for review and you'll need to hire an inspector. At the same time, you need to shop around for the best loan. I realize that not all states use attorneys for real estate transactions, but I'd recommend at least looking into it either way. In Illinois, the attorney will guide you through the attorney approval. And my only advice here is don't get the lowest cost attorney. A good attorney can save you more than their fee, and you won't even know it. Find an experienced real estate attorney, not a new one, and not one who does real estate on the side. I mean a real estate attorney that knows real estate. I've had attorneys slash and negotiate fees at the closing table or catch incorrect calculations on my behalf with the title companies and lenders, which they agreed to reduce or eliminate. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but a good attorney will catch things that you wouldn't even know were buried in your closing costs without them pointing them out to you. For your home inspector, some of the ratings websites are actually pretty useful. When you have the inspection, you need to be present so the inspector can explain any issues they find as well as hopefully explaining things that may need to be addressed in the future or how to maintain some of the components of the house. You'll want to use the inspection results to ask for a credit. Even if you saw the issues before, we'll use that knowledge now. Don't ask for the seller to correct anything, just get a credit. Also, don't be scared off by deferred maintenance. Many of the items won't need to be repaired immediately. Most houses have things that need to be fixed, but the homeowners just don't get around to fixing them all, and neither will you. So just try and get a credit, and don't make it a bigger deal than it needs to be. Remember, the other houses you were considering probably had similar issues, so you don't need to second guess yourself and think about, oh, what if I bought this other one? Obviously, I'm not talking about major structural issues, flooding, or unpermitted additions. Those are different issues. You will need to make a decision on your lender fairly quickly, as it normally takes a full 30 days to get a loan. Don't be surprised when your loan officer asks for a lot of documentation 
and then says they have everything, but ask for more a week later. And another clarification or an update the next week. Many times the loan officer puts together everything. Then someone else in the office reviews and they may think that you need something else. Then the file is sent to an underwriter at the actual lender and someone there reviews the file. And again, they may ask you for more info. Don't get upset or annoyed. Everyone is just doing their job and working to get your deal done. So try to respond quickly and keep your deal on track. Once your attorney approval period is over and you've agreed on any credits, you will need to deliver the balance of your earnest money. For most contracts, I have the buyer deliver $1,000 initial earnest money and then raise it to two or 5,000 after attorney approval. Be sure to keep copies of the checks you wrote. Many times the lender will want to see copies of them. You should continue to follow up with your attorney and lender till closing. Use this time to shop for and select an insurance provider as you'll need to have proof of insurance at closing. You should also look into which utilities need to be in your name and line up a moving truck as well. One other note about finances. Don't buy anything until after you close. Don't buy a car or a boat, get new credit cards, or charge any big purchases. Any of these can create a problem with your new loan, so don't do it. Just wait until after you close. Also, don't use emailed wire instructions or take a phone number from an email. Look it up on your own. Call the title company and get the information directly from them. Maybe even confirm it is correct by calling your attorney as well. Just be sure it all matches correctly before wiring any money. On the day before or the day of closing, you should have a final walkthrough. The intent of the final walkthrough is to ensure that nothing is damaged or taken that isn't supposed to be. For instance, was a dresser covering a large hole in a wall or did the movers break a window moving the furniture? Did the seller say they'd leave the washing machine but they took it? This is your last chance to verify that everything is as you expected it to be because this is what you'll be getting after closing. If you do see an issue, take a picture and bring it to the closing. At this point, your options are to ask for a credit or walk away and not close. A small credit is usually the way to go here. When you go to closing, you should review what you'll need with your attorney and title company. Normally, you'll need to bring your driver's license, proof of your paid homeowner's insurance, a list of any items or credits you expect to be getting, and a checkbook. When you leave the closing, be sure you have all of the keys and garage door openers or fobs. And when you get to your new property, be sure to immediately change all the locks and garage codes. Even the push button door openers have a code inside them change everything. I hope this video gave you a little more information about what you should expect when buying real estate. If you'd like to hear more from me, please consider subscribing to my channel and clicking the bell. Please like this video and leave me any comments or questions about this topic or anything else real estate related. Thank you for watching. Kenton knows.